Ten seconds, Super. Kiss my hot leg. I want you to hold it between your knees. There's never a cop around when you need one. You got a little pretty male thing. Well, do you, punk? I'm gonna nail you for picking your feet and fucking up. This cat shop is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. Welcome to Vintage Video's 12 Days of Christmas, where as a special treat this year, we'll be reviewing all of our Patreon poll options for December of 1973, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 50th anniversary of the release of Lady Snowblood. On December 1st, 1973, it was written by Norio Osada, based on a story by Kazuo Kamimura and Kazuo Koiki, directed by Toshio Fujita, and released by Toho. Kazuo Koiki's original Lady Snowblood manga was initially published as a series from February of 72 to March of 73 in something called Weekly Playboy, which, despite no relation to Hugh Hefner's Playboy, was also a pornographic magazine. (laughs) And the Snowblood serial was much more sexually graphic than the film. The film came together when producer Kikumaro Okuda saw some of actress Miko Kaji's Female Prisoner Scorpion series and immediately started planning a starring vehicle for her. He considered an adaptation of Koiki's Lady Snowblood to be a perfect match, though Koiki had envisioned Tomoko Ogawa in the part, and Okuda hired Norio Osada to write and Toshio Fujita to direct. Fujita was not totally sold on the subject matter because he did not direct action films prior to this, but when he shared the first draft of the story with Battle Royale director Kinji Fukasaku, Kinji reportedly said, if you don't direct this, I'm going to direct this. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So Fujita (laughs) moved forward with directing it himself. Miko Kaji was not excited to lead another revenge-heavy exploitation film and was in a position to negotiate out the source material's copious nudity as well as the opportunity to sing the film's theme song, Shuri no Hana herself, which was really everybody's win because she has a great voice. Mm -hmm. She was a pop singer too at the time. Kind of reminds me of uh, a little bit of the plot of uh, Perfect Blue. Sure, yeah. The film was produced on a limited budget with even a maximum 20,000 feet of film. They had the film set aside in advance, and they said, you can shoot this much. Wow. But the film was very well received and quickly sequelized the following year as Lady Snowblood 2, Love Song of Vengeance, though the first film had condensed the entire source series, so the second film was an entirely original story, which we'll discuss at the end. And they give you 50 feet extra film. Right, yeah. (laughs) Jiang Chang Hua's 1977 film, Broken Oath, is considered to be an unofficial Hong Kong remake of the story, And the manga was readapted into the 2001 film The Princess Blade, which is basically the same story. They changed all the character names, and it's like post-apocalyptic instead of being in in, uh, an ancient Japanese era. That sounds good. I want to watch that. It's not really an ancient Japanese. It's like 1883. (laughs) That's ancient. (laughs) Lincoln was ancient. And, of course, the same story was essentially recycled into the plot of Tarantino's Kill Bill about a woman seeking vengeance and using a katana to slash her way through a handwritten list of ruthless killers. More recently, the music video for Post Malone's Rockstar has paid homage to the 1973 film. We open on a snowy night in a dark prison. We see arms reaching through the wood bars, and behind them, a woman is giving birth. The baby's POV looks around the room at the frightened hospital staff and the distressed mother. The mom turns to the baby and names her Yuki and assigns her a mission of vengeance. The camera tilts up from the scene and zooms between the slats of the wall into the snowfall outside which is tinted red to resemble fluttering blood spatter on the breeze. We see a woman with a paper umbrella walking around a fortress in snow. She stops and listens before ducking around a corner as a rickshaw carrying Shiba Yama Genzo, leader of the Asakura Senryo gang, rolls up. The gang leader's goons argue a bit with the woman blocking the road and ultimately decide to kill her. The first man to come at her misses her, and she performs a front flip into the air and slices off his right arm in the process. He grips the violently spurting stump and swirls in the road, tossing blood in all directions. I love the jumps and how sort of superhuman they Mm -hmm. are. It definitely led to what Wo Ping has done with like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and all the wire work stuff. Oh, yeah. The next pair of henchmen attack in tandem, even as their boss instructs them to find out who paid this assassin before killing her. She slashes open their throats, and blood rockets from their necks to paint the walls around them. The gang leader is the next to face off with the woman, and asks her directly who hired her, but when he tries to engage in battle, she deflects him effortlessly and skewers him through the chest with a katana. He asks her name, and she names herself Revenge. 
何故だ恨み She says she's here on behalf of the innocent people he's hurt in the course of his evil deeds. As she walks away past his corpse, we hear this assassin's official theme song, Shura no Hana, or Flower of Carnage, which is memorably reused in Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill just before the bride crosses Cottonmouth off her kill list. Shura, Japanese for Carnage, is also the first half of the character's name. Shura Yuki, which loosely translates to Snow Carnage, or Snow Blood, which is in turn a twist on the Japanese translation for Snow White, Shira Yuki. She'll also be referred to as Child of the Netherworld. Actress Miko Kaji, playing Lady Snowblood here, is actually singing her own theme song. We cut to her slashing at plants beside a raging sea to prepare for future battles. We get a montage of Snowblood chopping away at bamboo shoots, and we cut to Chapter 1, Vengeance Binds Love and Hate. Okay, so obviously, so the chapter one thing is obviously, you know, Tarantino takes that. Yes. Um, is that just because of the manga or is there some other history of doing filmmaking where you call, you put something in chapters? In, 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 in Japanese, Japanese cinema? cinema? Yeah. Uh, not that I've seen, but I don't know that I've seen enough around the same time period to, to judge that necessarily. Sure. I haven't seen the, the female Prisoner Scorpion movies, um, which Miko Kaji did before this. So it's most likely a reference to the original source material. I think I think it's specifically okay. a reference to the well, way this the, film did things. And the story plot within this right. film that references that material. Yes, exactly. Okay. Which I think is interesting that he uses that. But, you know, from my recollection, Kill Bill doesn't have any references to like a manga type story or anything like that, right? Or of people knowing of the bride and her, of her legend. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's really discussed. Yeah. A narrator sets the stage temporally. Lady Snowblood, born in that first scene, is now 20 years old. The peaceful Tokugawa era, which began 25 years after the events of Kagimusha, ended its three-century rule with the 1867 resignation of shogun Tokugawa Yoshinobu. The Meiji era was known for its acceptance of Western influence, and in particular, scientific and industrial ideas that transformed the Empire of Japan. In the relative chaos of this transition to a worldly nation-state, corrupt politicians and businessmen were running rampant, leaving the poor to fight amongst themselves for scraps. Lady Snowblood was known by the people as a beauty from the netherworld, and few knew the hatred she carried in her heart. She moves through a town with people whose faces are smeared with soot, looking after someone named Sir Matsemon. The woman she asks gives her an angry glare, and the villagers all crowd around her and laugh. One man offers to lead her to Matsemon, and she has followed the whole way there by the entire giggling village. This doesn't seem like a trap at all. Uh, yeah. Not the entire village, just a group of men. Yeah, all the dudes. They lead her to a clearing in the woods where they begin chanting, pass it around, which is not a great sign. They tell her that the group's only rule is whatever they find they share evenly between them, and she is their latest find. When the first few approach her, they are handily swatted away. They change their goal, intending now to kill the woman, but good luck, dudes. She slides a blade from the handle of her umbrella when a man on crutches comes screaming over the hill to swat away the rapists with his crutch. This is Sir Matsemon, and he claims her as a personal guest. He tells the men that Shiba Jen, the man from the start of the film, had essentially bankrupted their village financially, and Snowblood here is the one who struck him down. So she did that at the beginning of the film to get in this guy's good graces yeah, to, mm -hmm. to get the locations yeah. of these people. Yeah, because he's the leader of of a beggar clan. Right. And so they have like eyes and ears everywhere. everywhere yeah. Later, the same man, doubting her prowess as an assassin, addresses her as Miss Shurayuki and asks what she could possibly want from them. She withdraws an envelope from her kimono and hands it over. It's a list of people she's looking for. Takemura Banzo Tsukamoto Gishiro Kitahama Okono. He tells her that all three can be found in Koichi Village in the Aimi district of the Shimane Prefecture. He says that he too is from there, and she admits she already knew that. She asks him about the Ketsuzi riot of the sixth year of the Maiji era, aka 1873, and I get the impression that was around 20 years ago, so it's probably 1893 here. Matsemon feigns ignorance of the riots, and Snowblood explains that these three stole money from Koichi Village during the riots. The three or four targets of her list were charging to get people out of the military draft. They left town with the money, and Matsumon corrects that he had heard there were four bandits involved, 
and Snowblood admits that the fourth man, Shokei Tokuichi, is already dead. Matsumon insists that it will be impossible to find these people with just names, but she begs him. He says she couldn't have even been born in the sixth year of the Maiji, and he's correct. We get a flashback to the riots told in the form of an illustrated slideshow, during which men over the age of 16 were drafted into battle, but the poorest villagers didn't want to be a part of the war and forged a rebellion. Rumors spread about these supposed men in white, representatives of the government who were often killed on sight by war-weary villagers intending to disrupt the draft. We cut back to the Maiji Year 6 riot as a family, mother, father, and child, walk along a path to the seaside village of Koichi. An alarm sounds in the distance, and the child running ahead of his parents is captured. The father is pointed out by a crowd of approaching villagers as one of the men in white because of his all-white outfit. He assures these men he is not from the government, but the village's new grade school teacher. They call BS, and a man in a bandana slices into the man's left shoulder and takes a fountain of blood square in the face. He is identified in a freeze frame as Tsukamoto Gishiro. A second man in a top hat puts a second blade through the man's chest before a label of Takemura Bonzo. A third man with a big mole on his cheek stabs a spear into the father's back, and predictably this is Shokai Tokuichi, the man Snowblood has already reported dead. A woman puts a blade to the neck of the mother, and we see in another freeze frame that the sword holder here is the third name from Snowblood's list, Kitahama Okono. The bloodied school teacher collapses to the floor, and Tsukamoto stabs him repeatedly in the back. A line of stationary farmers now encircle the murder, but do nothing to help. Because as far as they knew, this is preventing their children from being sent to war. Right. So she should kill all of these people. Mm -hmm. The woman mourns her dead husband and slowly looks up at his attackers with rage in her eyes. We see her POV looking up at the four killers, and it's not unlike how Quentin sometimes frames the four killers of Bill's deadly Viper assassination squad in Kill Bill. I think specifically after she gets beaten up at the wedding by the four yeah. of them, she looks up and they're standing in the same positioning. A tear rolls down her cheek. We cut to a young snowblood walking the grounds of a temple and being graduated from her education by a reverend named Dokai. He and his wife have looked after her ever since the deaths of her parents. He urges her to forget all her anger and hatred, and then, conversely, reminds her not to forget her mission of vengeance that she was assigned at birth. That part, hold on to. Apparently this priest is the man who taught her to be a deadly assassin. I assumed he was the narrator voice, but yeah. I don't think he is because later he talks about himself in the third person if it's mm -hmm. him. But apparently all the training involves being inside barrels. Right. <laughs> Weird, that didn't pay off at all. <laughs> in the present again, Lady Snowblood is seen praying beside a Satoba or grave marker labeled Kojima Sayo, her mother's name. She reads another Satoba with the name Kobayashi Tora the wife of the priest, and nurse to her mother that assisted in raising her. Not actually a nurse, but a cellmate of her mother's who was acting as midwife to the birth. We hear Dokai, the priest's voice again, and he suggests that because Shura is without an earthly home, she is not of this realm and thus not beholden to the laws of his religion. She has no chance of being saved, even by Buddha, and so she should seek her vengeance with everything in her. We cut back to the night of her birth. Kobayashi Tora is acting as midwife and comments on the unusual difficulty of this birth. Sayo, the mother, overhears that she may die tonight and gives her blessing as long as the baby is saved. Someone, possibly Atora, reminds her that dying for the baby could be considered a waste since she doesn't even know the father, and Sayo says, if this baby doesn't make it, then Atora will die as well. We get another flash of Sayo crying under the bandits who murdered her husband, and in another insert we see that her son too has been killed. The contents of his head steadily flow over the side of a footbridge into a reddening stream. We cut inside the neighboring water mill where the bandits are each taking turns with her. The entire sequence is muted except for the mechanical workings of the mill, and Kitahama Okono is smiling and cheering the men on as they have their way with her. We cut from Sayo's rape to the baby being born sometime later, and we see the mother and daughter laying calmly side by side in bed as Sayo finishes telling Otora her story. Obviously, at this point, I assumed that Snowblood was... The, the product result. of this. Yeah. yeah, that was my assumption as well, which is not true, as yeah. it turns out. We get a sort of Mount Rushmore insert of the faces of the four bandits appearing one at a time in sync with the chiming of the bell beside which her husband was killed. We see the four of them in black and white photos standing in a graveyard and then dividing up the money they stole from her village, 270 yen per person they swindled. Next, in a few quick photos, we see that Snowblood's mother, Sayu, lured Hokai Tokuichi into bed and stabbed him to death when he least expected it. 
the scene is reminiscent to Oren Ishii's origin in Kill Bill Volume 1. Mm-hmm. Or is that Volume 2? I forget. Uh, no, it's 1 because yeah. that's the only one she's in, I think. We learn here that Sayo was arrested for Tokuichi's murder and that she's giving birth to Snowblood in a prison. Sayo tells Otora that she slept with the prison guards in an intentional effort to bear a child whom she is now charging with the task of avenging her death and the deaths of her own husband and son. She calls the baby a child of the netherworld and then dies beside her. All the women attending to Sayo cry loudly, scaring the baby. Like, they freak out more than the baby does. Mm -hmm. Even though they saw this coming for days. Yeah, like, it's pretty obviously that she's gonna die. We cut to the priest and cellmate raising Yuki together. The first lesson we see, the girl is six, tucked into a wooden barrel, and instructed to push outward inside the barrel to stay locked in. And then, the priest Dokai kicks it down a rocky hill. The barrel collides with a boulder, and the girl is thrown into the dirt, and Dokai criticizes her form. But this kind of looks a little bit fun, right? Yeah. Okay, (laughs) just making sure. (laughs) This entire training montage plays very much the same as Beatrix Kiddo's training with Cruel Master Pai Mei in Tarantino's Kill Bill. But far fewer barrels. Right. (laughs) When he spars with the girl using wooden swords, he has no mercy, and he beats her to the ground. In a rematch with swords sometime later, His first swing misses her so barely that all her clothes fall to the floor, and a second swing draws blood from her arm, but she drinks it for sustenance. Another barrel comes down a hill, and this time, when he slices it in half at the bottom, the girl leaps into the air and knocks him to the ground. Now we see her again as an adult at her mother and adoptive mother's graves. She promises vengeance as a tear drips down her face. Chapter 2. Crying Bamboo Dolls of the Netherworlds Snowblood receives a message with the location of Takemura Bonzo, one of the names on her list. The camera floats into a house on the beach and we see a young woman, Kobue, weaving baskets. In the next room she hears her father having a coughing fit and goes to rub his back. Kobue tells him the basket weaving is going well and he apologizes for making her work so hard. She leaves for the day and throws the baskets off a cliff into the sea. I, I thought this was some kind of fishing technique. I thought that too at first. It was like, okay. But there's no strings attached to these baskets. Well, yeah. okay, but I didn't think it was a fishing technique because I had spent the previous 15 minutes going down a deep dive rabbit hole of what, of what is a bamboo are. wife. <laughs> because oh, okay. The, the, I was just like, bamboo wife? That sounds fascinating. Now I'm going to look this up. And I'm like, there's, they come in all different shapes and sizes, but they're literally meant for sleeping. So yeah, they, they didn't. Uh, they didn't have the high tech stuff we have today. Mm. No, yet. no, no, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Lars and the real bamboo wife. No, they are like. I don't want to they're say like they're like body pillows. They're like yeah, they're body yeah. pillows. They're pillows. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When she turns around at the top of the cliff, Snowblood is standing there, and Kobue explains that she couldn't sell them anyway. She gives Snowblood a small wooden hairpin and introduces herself. Snowblood is shaken to learn that this is a relative of her target. We cut to a gambling hall where a pair of large henchmen give Kabue a stack of cash and tell her about the client she will be servicing tonight. Right away we see the same men enter Takemura's home and inform him that his daughter throws all of her wares into the sea. They tell Takemura that she's been working for them as a prostitute so she didn't come home empty-handed and it's all his fault. Takemura says his daughter would never engage in prostitution. Back at the casino, Snowblood sits outside the game as men throw in their bets, and eventually Takemura wanders in. It's like he's being strong-armed into the game by these people who are trying to prove to him that his daughter works for them, I guess. I took it more like he felt guilted into trying to gamble his way back out of debt. So that, that she wouldn't so have that to So that she wouldn't that. have to do yeah. what he's yeah. doing. And so he turns to gamble and and cheat yeah. uh, because he knows he could he could fix whatever's going on. It just seems weird to me that the last part of the conversation we see with him and them in the home is him saying, I don't believe you. She wouldn't do that. So how did they ever get him to come to the casino if they didn't convince him somehow? They should have provided some kind of evidence Mm. to indicate. And I guess they do show him like pay stubs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. They also tell him, it's just like, shouldn't she be home by now? Yeah. And uh, uh, Snowblood is actually running the game. Yeah. But at the beginning, she's kind of sitting back. And then later on, she's somehow she's worked her way into the position of dealer like she's center in the middle of the game well it, it reminds me a lot of a uh, samurai champlo like the oh, sure yeah like the main girl in that is like a gambler like a like a what are you what's the word i'm looking for for who runs the table Shark? dealer no no like the like like if you not not the dealer oh you're talking about the um 
it begins with like a ch right or a croupier croupier yeah something like that i don't know that word it's french french <laughs> it's french, french toast <laughs> how about some fucking french toast <laughs> what the french toast <laughs> <What>? <laughs> As the dealer of the game, Snowblood notices Takamura cheating to win money and buy his daughter out of a life of prostitution. The big-time gamblers that he dragged here notice too and pull him into another room to practice their knife throwing around him and eventually into him. <laughs> Begging for his life, he offers the life of his daughter and they tell him it's too late, suggesting either that they don't need his permission or that they've already had her. Their target practice is interrupted when Snowblood bursts in and grabs one of the men by his knife hand. She claims responsibility as dealer for not catching the man's cheating and offers to pay back the stolen money. When they don't leave, she begs them to spare the man's life so she can take it in the service of fulfilling her mother's last wishes of vengeance. The big boss enters and agrees to let Takamura go. Right on cue, Kabue enters and offers to take her father out of here. Lady Snowblood tells her how she can find her in Tokyo if she wants to later, Somehow, Kabue mistakes it as an invitation to move in with her and explains she has to stay here to take care of her father. Snowblood finds him at a bar on the way home, chugging sake, and just watches him from the next table over. He thanks her for rescuing him from the bookies. He admits that he would kill himself if it wasn't for Kabue, which makes it that much stranger that we just saw him offer her up to save yeah. himself. It's like, mm, no you wouldn't, you're just a big chicken shit loser. Snowblood invites Takemura to leave together. Then tells him it's time to start the journey of death and may cut to them on a beach together. She asks him if her face reminds him of someone he may have raped in the past. Like, think of all the people you've <laughs> raped. When she says her mother's name, he collapses at her feet apologizing and then says he was forced to do it by the others. She asks him where she can find them. He begs forgiveness and tries to use his daughter to guilt her into sparing him, but like 20 minutes ago, he offered her to the casino as property in exchange for his life. She slashes him across the chest, and the camera quick zooms out hundreds of feet into the sky. It's such a cool shot of her killing this guy. Takemura collapses in the surf across a pile of rocks and dies... Sorry. And dies the ocean red with his copious blood. <laughs> also, he dies. <laughs> also, he dies. <laughs> dies. The ocean red. <laughs> and he's dead. The ocean red. What? The ocean rise. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It's a good thing she did all that expert training so she could cut this pathetic lump in half while he <laughs> cried on his knees. Yeah. I could have friggin' done that. <laughs> but but I think that's why she does this she thing. She's so mad. Like, she's like, I'm going to drag your body up this yeah, cliff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to throw it off. Yeah. Unsatisfied with the kill, she spends probably hours <laughs> dragging the man's corpse to the top of a cliff only to throw him back into the same sea from which she just fished him out. But and also, worse, now he probably landed on one of those wives. <laughs> He's got a little sea wife at the bottom well, of the ocean. That's what I was going to say. It, mi it mimics the, his daughter's What his daughter actions. was doing. Yeah. 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 Well, she like, should have thrown her down too, though. Yeah, he, he lands in the basket. It's like three points. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but net. <laughs> we cut to a cemetery for Chapter 3, Umbrella of Blood Heart and Strewn Flowers. We zoom into Snowblood's furious face and then get a reverse angle insert to reveal the headstone of Tsukamoto Jishiro. It seems as though death has beaten her to one of her targets. She already knew this, though, from the earlier conversation. Right. Yeah. Or she suspected it. I suppose... No, no, no. She says Takuichi is dead. That's the one that her mother killed. But we haven't shown that part yet. Well, she... Or no, we have shown that. That was the one that looked like Oren Ishii's origin story. Well, well, we'll find that she did get word that this guy was dead, but they did, she didn't believe it. Right. She didn't get word. She, no. she did not know this until now she's learning now that this guy was dead oh see i thought they said that they told her that he was dead and she didn't believe it and so she went to but, go see the no that was her auntie who was the one who okay. had been told that he died three years ago but she didn't believe it until she found this headstone i feel like i'm confused so the guy said that there were four bandits right right and the mother killed one of them before that's why the, she was in prison. right 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 that's why she was in prison she killed one of them which left three right mm -hmm. and she just killed one she just killed one, this one's dead, and the third one is the woman. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm I'm following. She's so furious at having missed out on a kill that she whips out her sword anyway and just starts wailing on this headstone until her sword breaks. And that last hit must have done a lot of extra damage because mm. the final sword hit before it breaks does <laughs> yeah, the most like damage. Yeah, it's a critical hit. 
In reality, she should go back and kill Dokai, the priest, for wasting 20 years on training she could have accomplished in a couple weekends. Like, just learn how to sneak up on people and stab them in the back. These, <laughs> these aren't, they don't even know you're coming after them. On her way out of the cemetery, she crosses paths with a man coming in. He sees the chip in the headstone and turns to follow her the other way. Later, at a small restaurant, Snowblood's aunt, I guess, or a family friend, she calls her auntie here, comments on how disappointed Snowblood was to learn that Jishiro is dead, but takes the comment a suspicious step further by adding, but now that she's seen the tombstone with her own eyes, well, what else can we do? It's like, that definitely proves it. There's a tombstone. <laughs> yep. Matsumon claims the man died three years ago in a shipwreck smuggling opium to America. Auntie reminds Snowblood she still has Kiriyama Okono to track down. Matsumon claims that his men are doing all they can to find her. Later in the day, the man from the cemetery catches up with Snowblood again, but she senses him following her and asks why he's here. He asks why she defaced the tombstone. He introduces himself as Ashiro Ryuri, and he's basically playing the part of manga author Kazuo Koiki, a novelist for a publication who wants to adapt her story to series for publication. She tells him to leave her alone. We see him working late at night on art for a manga adaptation of her story anyway. Without her permission, the stories are published, and here we see actual illustrations from the original manga. We see a highlight reel of all the scenes that have played out so far from the source material. The story proves exceedingly popular, and Snowblood eventually learns from the priest that he is the one who shared her story with Ryuri. He explains that once word of the manga has found Okono, she will take action and make her presence known. The priest takes a moment to talk about how great the writer and artist of the story are and to blatantly spell out all the themes of the piece. <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> it's like, by the way, this guy is so mm -hmm. great. When was the last time we saw a character in a movie talk about how great the writer of the novel adapted into that movie was? Australian film. Winter of Our Dreams. Actress who just passed away in the last month. She was in Carrie. No idea. Tim. Oh, I didn't realize that she had passed away. Yeah, she just passed away. They mentioned the book. She's reading Thornbirds at a table on her patio. And Mel Gibson says, is it any good? And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm really loving it. And it's written by the same person who wrote the story adapted into Tim. Okay. Got it. Woodbow? Yes, it's very interesting. We cut back to the offices of the artist Ryu, and Kobue is here begging him to verify the story he's published is true, in which case she must avenge her father by killing Lady Snowblood. Even though the story must have laid out the things that her right? father did. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. You have to avenge your family no matter what they did and what they were. And this story is obviously mirrored by the Nikki Green character in Kill Bill, the daughter of Vernita Green, whose mother is a target of Beatrix Kiddo's vengeance and who is invited to avenge her own mother when she feels prepared. And a lot of people have said that they want to see, like, Maya Hawk and Zendaya come back for volume three and oh, fight each other. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Uniformed men, maybe police, break into the artist's home to arrest him because Snowblood is still a wanted fugitive and they believe he may be harboring her to get her story so accurately. While the police torture him for information at the station, Kirihama Okono arrives and demands to know Snowblood's whereabouts before joining the police and beating Ryu unconscious. They try waterboarding him in his sleep, but he tells them nothing. When they leave him unattended for a bit, he lays back down in the water, and I thought this was him committing suicide so they couldn't torture him anymore. Like, he's like, ha you idiots left this bowl of water in here. I'm just going <laughs> to drown myself. That night, Kirihama's guards are staged all around Okono's courtyard when a purple umbrella glides down into the bushes. Well, uh... Kobue goes and tells Lady Snowblood's people about the arrest. Like, she, I don't know why she Oh, does she informs it. Lady Snowblood in person that yeah. the artist has been arrested for, yeah, yeah. for knowing who you are. That night, Kitahama's guards are staged all around Okono's courtyard when a purple umbrella glides into the bushes. When they go to check it out, we see Snowblood behind them ready to pounce. In her own room, Okono is doing some kind of ritual and green light and miming sword work until a guard informs her that Snowblood has arrived. Snowblood makes quick work of the guards in the courtyard, and the whole sequence plays out a lot like Beatrix Kiddo's assault on the Crazy 88 in Kill Bill Volume 1. It's actually just Volume 1 that most of these pieces are coming from. There's mm. not that much from Volume 2, which is funny because Volume 2 has Shogun Assassin and the Lone Wolf and Cub stuff. 
Okono arrives, having brought a gun to a sword fight, and holds it to the artist's head as if this man makes a useful hostage. And it's like, that guy wrote a book I told him not to. Yeah. I'll fucking shoot him. I don't care. You call that a spoon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see you've played knifey gunny before. Okono takes a few shots at Snowblood until Ryu dive tackles the candle lighting the room, and they're all plunged into darkness. Just, just blow it out. Yeah, it looks like he leans over <laughs> to blow at it, and he just can't do it like it's a trick candle, so he just jumps on it. <laughs> I keep trying to blow this candle up, but I keep like, relighting. Lol, I got that at the eight-year-old birthday store. It's just for eight-year-olds. <laughs> they only have eight candles. Okono shoots the artist, and Snowblood slashes at her and shoves her down some stairs. Okono's guards swarm her on the floor, and Snowblood backs into the shadows and tosses something they call thunder sand down at them. Which, according to my cursory research, is basically a mixture of gunpowder and iron filings. Yeah. But it looks like she pulls it out of her hair, and I was like, is that the thing that the girl gave her after she threw the baskets in the ocean? Well, the girl just gave her, like, a... It looked like a hairpin. It a had wooden like a hairpin. It had a woven end ball. bit on it. Yeah. So, potentially, that could have held something? Yeah. And maybe she just filled it with thunder sand. I mean, in, there are several shots of her wearing hairpins that are, like, these red looking beads mm-hmm. yeah and maybe it it's something like sort that. of remind beads beads, <laughs> beads. <laughs> <You're saying> beads? <laughs> beads? <laughs> no it actually reminds me of those balls that they used to use as fire extinguishers oh, that you yeah. would just like throw and then they explode on the fire an ampule i don't get to use that word very often is that what they're called yeah like a sealed glass container with a liquid inside yeah like the stink bombs that i used to get at the simi valley swap meet they were in ampules. <laughs> it's a little glass thing you hold onto the top and you shatter it on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stink up a theater. <laughs> ruin a weekend. The guards caution each other against breathing in the powder, but Snowblood maneuvers through the clouds and slashes them all to death. Snowblood looks around and realizes that Okono isn't here. She follows a trail of blood into the back room and finds Okono has hung herself in her own office. Snowblood is livid to find another of her targets dead by someone else's hands, this time her own. Snowblood is so furious, she slices the hanging torso in half and blood rains down. Yeah, uh, I would have done this anyway, whether I was mad or not, just to make sure. She wasn't faking it? Yeah. It was like... <laughs> At first I thought she had painted her face to make her look, and that the fact that all the blood is raining out was a sign that she was still alive. Yeah. yeah. Because she, she, lo- she hasn't been hanging that long, so it's possible that she would still have that much liquid blood moving around. But also it, it kind of seems like she looks at, like, yeah. I, I thought she like. She does look real dead. I thought Lady Snowblood thought she was alive because as she's rotating, her eyes look at her. Yeah. And I thought, oh, she's still alive. She's just faking and she couldn't keep her eyes still. Yeah. That's why she cut her in half. I was like, oh, but. I but in that- the aftermath, she's so angry that it's clear. Yeah. She was like, God fucking damn it. And just chopped it in half to, to be gross. A curtain lowers behind the hanging woman, and I wanted the whole movie to have been a prank, and this was a banner explaining the joke, but she just (laughs) cut an actor in half by mistake because no one expected that move. Her mom comes out, and she's like, oh my god, what have you done? (laughs) Ryu tries to comfort her in the wake of this disappointment, and sometime later, we see the artist trying to write chapter four of the Snowblood story when he is visited at his office by a man in dark glasses. He's able to recognize this man as Tsukamoto Jishiro, the last name on Snowblood's list, who had faked his own death at sea. Turns out, he also faked Okono's suicide to convince Snowblood that there was no more vengeance to be had. So, he claims to have hung her there. Like, he yeah. grabbed her, hung her, and then ran out of the building. That was real quick. It's like, she was gonna kill her anyway. She was anyway. being chased down. Yeah. They were moments away there. But he's really good at, like, running all of a sudden, though. We'll find the out. only reason to do that would be if Okono knew that he was still alive and had faked his death. Because otherwise, it's like, why bother? Like, Snowblood's going to kill her anyway. Just let her do it. Yeah, but, well, I mean, yeah, I guess. Either way, the threat's going to be liquidated. It's possible that that she didn't know. Like, he's like, I don't know if he know, she knows that I faked my death or not. Like, maybe. maybe. If, if, she, if she thinks I'm still but alive. I, I think if he definitely knew that she was in on it, that he'd worry that Snowblood would, like, torture her to get that information. Mm. I don't know how more people don't know that this man is alive. Because he, he doesn't change his appearance at all. And he goes into this whole spiel here about how, basically, there are no weapons get, get sold in Japan without him. Right. Even to the government. So, yeah. like, there's got to be a large number of people who work with him on a regular basis. And none of them recognized him from his time as a high-profile criminal. As a smuggler? Criminal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and they don't even say what his alias is. Right. 
Yeah, he never gives a fake name. He just mm-hmm. says, the guy you knew as Jishiro is dead. That's all. I am Sheer Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's like French lieutenant's woman changing her name from Woodruff to Roughwood. <laughs> just switching the syllables. He's here to inform Ryu that he knows all about Snowblood and isn't worried. He's here to provide weapons of war to the Japanese Empire. He offers Ryu a place in his organization, but he refuses. Unclear so far their exact connection to each other, but we'll learn it very quickly. After the man leaves, Snowblood drops by, and Ryu drops a couple truth bombs on her right away. The first is that Jishiro is alive, and the second is that Jishiro is his father. Yeah. Which explains why he was at the cemetery that day and noticed his father's grave was right. defaced. So he was specifically going to that yeah. grave. It's like, I just fucking put these flowers down and you cut them up. Also, like, she could have caught up with that rickshaw real quick. Yeah. Well, he stopped her, though, because she did turn to go after yeah. it. Um, but, but why? Because he didn't want his father to die. But <laughs> Yes, he does. Oh, yeah. That's right. He does. I don't, I don't get why he stops her. That's a that's a great point. Was he worried about her safety and her ability to get to him with the other people that were with him? I, I guess, but it, she's more than capable. Yeah. We get a quick montage of every Ryu POV of her rage over the course of this film as he's reminding himself like, shit, I definitely shouldn't have told her that that was my dad. I should have just let her kill the guy. And then, you know, that's that mattress, man. Let, let's part ways. See, now, okay, so at this point, I was thinking it's her brother. Right. At the beginning, because I'm Mm. like, oh, maybe he wasn't dead, and maybe that guy came back and was just like, you work for me now. You are my son. Oh, I thought you meant the other way around, that that is his father, but that she is also Jishiro's daughter. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't think about that. I I mean, yeah, that could be, but I was thinking they were half-siblings, and that this guy just didn't remember that he wasn't actually the guy's son and right. it's her brother. Yeah, and no, that's that works he's too. He's helping her give... Her stepbrother? Her stepbrother and yeah. he's helping give vengeance. Half-brother, not stepbrother, half-brother. Half-brother, yeah. yeah. Same mother. Chapter four, The House of Joy, The Final Hell. <laughs> that doesn't sound like joy. We see Snowblood in a carriage later pulling out the handle of her umbrella, which is actually a sheathed katana, and tucking it into the back of her kimono. The carriage pulls up to a charity masquerade party. The inside is another similar set to Tarantino's House of Blue Leaves from the end of Volume 1. Among the women dancing in masks, I think we're meant to see Bonzo's daughter Kabue here. The people are dancing to Strauss's Danube Waltz, which we've now heard three times on the show before. Any thoughts? Well, I can name the obvious one of 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's correct. That was the most recent. Can I get a hint? Is it... Can I, can I can I try? Oh, it yeah, 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 is it Heaven's Gate? Heaven's Gate is one of them. Oh, there's another one. Yep. People are dancing to it. Uh, is it Heaven's Gate? <laughs> <laughs> Nazis are dancing to it. Nazis are dancing to it. Um, in the seventies, as the seventies. Wait. Nazis in the seventies. Uh huh. Uh, the boys from Brazil. That's it. Moving around the edge of the dance floor, Snowblood and Jishiro seem to spot each other. She follows him through a secret passage to a back room where he chases her around with a katana at the ready. He manages to cut her once and she spins, taking both his hands off and sending them sailing across the room. This was so great. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. (laughs) With her last cut across his chest, we get the most fantastic melted crayon blood spurting out of the wound. It's like, it's almost silvery. There's like a Mm -hmm. metallic color to it it's incredible i love this blood so much all the blood in this movie but this is the it's sludgiest so, it's so thickest. thick and yeah. chunky yeah this guy has to see a doctor about <laughs> multiple problems <laughs> his his recent handectomy and his <laughs> syrup blood <laughs> so many issues you seem to have lost a number of hands <laughs> <laughs> show, how many stumps show me on your stumps how many hands you've lost <laughs> When she grinds, when she grinds to toe for the good g- g- crab, <laughs> when she tries to toe for grace. Are you having a stroke right now? Well, you're giving the my nurse. blood syrup. <laughs> <laughs> my brain has blood syrup. <laughs> when she tries to go for the coup de gras, Ryu wrestles her sword down, and together they notice a seam in the makeup around his father's face. When they peel it back, they see Jishiro has faked his death yet again. I, I love that it, okay I love that it really kind of mounts it's just like oh this it's not just a seam in the makeup it's like the fake, fake mm-hmm. uh, beard starts to peel up and they peel that off they peel the fake mustache off and then they start it's to like, like oh the chin's coming lift up lift the chin 
<laughs> they just and keep they, digging through his head. <laughs> and like, then they cut to a wide and they peel the whole face off. Yeah. yeah. But it's like maybe he was just wearing a fake beard yeah. to, to, to hide his identity. Not a uh, real beard. <laughs> Hoping the beards. <laughs> <laughs> 100% not a real beard. I was telling Jess though I would have liked it if he peeled this mask off and the face was the son's face and she looks over her shoulder and starts <laughs> he's gone. peeling off the son's face and the father is standing what? there and they start fighting again immediately. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Was he just trying to kill me? He was on my team, wasn't he? And she peels another face back and it's Tom Cruise. It doesn't make sense. No, no, it's John Travolta. John Cruise. What? It's both of them. It's and Nick then Cage. it's Nicolas Cage. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Snowblood senses they're being watched, and Ryu breaks the mirror across the room, revealing a compartment inside. <laughs> and then <laughs> Jishiro stupidly steps in the middle of the small room to reveal himself before <laughs> running away. After, he's not in there to begin right, with. It's and an empty jumps room and it's back like, in, like <laughs> evil cartoon villain, like, whoa. Yeah, he's like, go. fuck my wallet. And he comes back <laughs> and he runs off. Uh, if for sure, what happened was he was supposed to be in there. And they broke the glass, and he wasn't on on the in the room that he was supposed to be. So he runs out. It's like, no, it's too late. We yeah. broke it. You can yeah. run now. We had one mirror. We can only afford seven years of bad luck. We only have twenty thousand feet of film to work with. It's also possible that it was like, don't come out until after the glass shatters because we don't have insurance. Mm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. wait until this. It thing wasn't explodes. fake glass, yeah, and they're like, real. you can't literally be behind it. Yeah, but but there's like a chair in there for observing, as if he had been watching or uses this often to watch, to watch other right, people. Yeah. But there was another chair that was set up, like, yeah, not in use, like put right. aside and upside down on a table. It's like, yeah. do you have guests <laughs> yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. you know, you don't want to watch your entertainment alone. Snowblood chases him upstairs and they continue fighting along the second story balcony overlooking the dance floor. Well, they, they uh, her and uh, Ryu go in, but there's two separate set of stairs right. and they don't know which one he went up. So they split yeah. up. The sun goes up to the right and she goes up to the left. Vice and it turns out, uh, maybe. Anyway, Ryu has a sword trained on his father when his dad pulls a gun. Oh, this is really the knifey spoony moment. Yeah. yeah. Snowblood seems to threaten her mother's rapist telepathically, mm-hmm. assuring him that this is the culmination of 20 years of training and she's about to murder this guy. Ryu pushes his father against a wall and takes three shots from the gun. Jishiro gets a fourth shot over his shoulder, grazing Snowblood's cheek, and then she charges full speed, crashing her katana through the artist's back and pinning his father to the wall with the same thrust. Father and son shish she pulls the sword back and takes a final bullet before she gets one last good swipe at Jishiro's throat, coaxing a majestic fountain of blood, not unlike the one from Shogun Assassin, that even the victim was impressed by. But to have it happen to my own neck <laughs> is ridiculous <laughs> outside the club snowblood stumbles through the falling snow until kabui daughter of banzo appears from the shadows and plunges another blade into our heroine's chest the famous shura no hana theme plays again and snowblood continues invincibly through the snow she finally collapses and squeezes a handful of snow until it crunches hard in her hand and she presses a lump to her face to sob into her life's work is complete When the sun rises the next morning, she stands again because the writer had already basically decided on a franchise approach to this property Mm. and an animated blood spray fills the screen from the outside to the center and the film ends. Yeah, I love this end because I was I was pretty sure she was dead. And then and then they brought her back. And I was Mm. really glad because I'm like, it felt like a rebirth because Mm -hmm. they had already basically established that there is no life for you. You are not a human. You are this thing that only seeks vengeance. Right. And she's not necessarily in geisha makeup, but she's very pale for the whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. And when we see her in the the light of dawn, it's the first time that she has any kind of skin tone because mm. it's like she's finally a person. She's not of the netherworld anymore. Yeah, yeah. And does but does uh does Kabui have to kill her again, or does she count that as a kill and go, I avenged him? All I had uh, to do was stab you. Yeah, That's yeah. Enough. She got her stab. Just go I think stab. it's good. In the sequel, uh, 1974's Lady Snowblood Two: Love Song of Vengeance, we start with Snowblood still on the run for these killings. And no amount of men thrown at her are able to bring her in. Eventually, she surrenders out of boredom, basically, and is sentenced to death. Her carriage is intercepted by bandits on her way to execution, and they employ her as a spy. 
She poses as a maid to an insurgent in a small village and keeps an eye on the man to locate a secret document in his home, but the man earns her trust and she switches allegiances to join his cause. Eventually, the man is captured by the police and tortured for information on her whereabouts, at which point another subplot is introduced about a plague that's killing off all the poorer villagers and nobody cares about it because it's only affecting the poor people. And it gets complicated and weird in the second half. Mm. It's not as fun. It's not as simple a story. And the, the fight, the choreography isn't as good. And there's not as much of this beautiful waxy blood stuff. Yeah, no, no, no hand capitations yeah and the, and the song doesn't come back which is really disappointing because i mean the music not even just the the shura nohana song but every music cue in this movie is golden like anytime something cool is happening it's, so it's the most epic yeah. jazzy it's, perfect sound that you wanted to play i i i just i also love the the feeling like it feels anachronistic in right. that it's d- definitely of the 70s and not of the 1890s or whatever Mm -hmm. this is in japan but it just it feels so epic that it just fits yeah absolutely and the the music is it's not the same guy coming back so it's it's not as good in the second half but it's still miko kaji playing the character um but uh yeah it's still probably worth watching um but yeah so that's uh that's lady snowblood big thumbs up obviously oh yeah i loved it yeah this this was this was really great uh just can't talk enough about the blood splatter. Yeah, I mean, it's just it. There, there's one where it's clearly just like a like a can of spray paint that she stabbed, and it just. Are you sp- talking about in the last set when uh, she gets it on her face? Yeah, uh, this is during the fight with uh, the the the, the fake police guards. In, oh, okay. In, in uh, Okomo's compound. Yeah. Like she stabs a guy, and you can see like there's like an aerosol spray. Yeah. It hits her face. It's like that, that was, was not on purpose. Yeah, like I say, I think that's just a can of spray paint. Yeah, that not she, on just purpose. she got she got it in the face, and she stayed in character for that moment, and they left it. It looks so good. It looks it's great. just like how could you do that on purpose? Yeah. Honestly, like it was so perfect. But this whole tradition of these like explosive blood effects started with an accident, basically, because in the Yojimbo sequel, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Sanjuro. They had high pressure blood vessels mm-hmm. that were supposed to like pop and spray blood in different stab scenes. And there's one that just went totally fucking overboard, exploded out of yeah, his yeah. chest. And they were showing the dailies back. And of course, I was like, I don't hate that. Like, that's not <laughs> completely awful. What if we just left that one in? And then that became like a thing that people were like, that was so badass. Like, mm-hmm. let's do yeah. this insane, like high power arterial spray and stuff. And it started to become a more common thing. But yeah, all, all the explosions of blood are so great in this. And she's such a great character. I mean, I feel like it's it's almost cheating when you engage in this trope of like the revenge and having to kill a bunch of people's story because it's like mm. you set up this character, you have your John Wick, you have your whoever who is like owed vengeance and you're just excited to watch them kill people. It's the Taken movies. It's yeah, like yeah. any any of these movies with the same formula where you're just like, you set up a person, you knock that person down. The people get harder and harder to beat as you go. But this has just the the added awesomeness of just really competent cinematography, really beautiful like artistic shots of I, I love the shots looking out at the snowy wasteland from inside the jail at the beginning yeah. with the snow fluttering by the windows and everything. I mean I, they're not windows, they're just slats on the wall. I mean I realize that we're watching like a a Criterion Blu-ray. Right. Yeah, um, it's a very yeah. nice transfer. But it's just it's so incredibly shot and it's so beautiful. It just doesn't even look like it could have been right. made in this year. Mm. And and Lady Snowblood too, also Criterion, also has a very very clean transfer, not as pretty looking because there's 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 an eye for this one that that is doing a much better job. It's just so beautifully shot. Yeah, yeah a lot of handheld. Um, there's some really interesting Dutch angles yeah. happening in there in some places. Oh yeah, when, when he's talking to his father yeah. before they reveal he's what the father. What is up with that? Yeah. That was like, that was such a unique shot. It just like, it it put everything, you know, on edge. Yeah. And the snap zooms. The snap like, zooms are so fun. Whoosh. But especially that one where when she kills the first person on her list finally, and it's like, oh my god, I've been, I've been waiting 20 years to get one of you, and then it just flies up like basically God perspective of this murder happening, and Buddha like shrugging like, She's from the netherworld. I'm going to fucking judge her. The guy said I can't do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> I have to yeah. learn to kill these people. Yeah, it's amazing. The director here was Toshia Fujita. He returned the following year to direct Lady Snowblood 2, Love Song of Vengeance, but it's not coming from 
the source material of a manga. So you basically don't have a full storyboard of your movie when you sit down to start. So you have to pick the camera angles and that makes things harder to uh, be artistic with. The first writer credit is for Kazuo Kamimura, who also has a story credit on Snowblood 2 and a story credit in 2001's The Princess Blade, which, as I said, is a very loose adaptation of the same story. Uh, the other writer is Kazuo Koiki, who we previously discussed for his work on the manga adapted into the Lone Wolf and Cub series, which was in turn recycled into the American release Shogun Assassin, which we covered last season. Koiki also gets a story credit on The Princess Blade and song credits in Kill Bill and this for the lyrics written for the theme song. He actually wrote the lyrics to the song that, uh, that she's singing. What do you guys think you prefer between this and Shogun Assassin? That's a hard choice, right? Oh, I think that is hard. I feel like I have to watch them back to yeah, back that's probably in true. order yeah. to, to decide. I, they, they I think off the top kills. of my head, I would go Shogun Assassin, but I, I need to rewatch I, them both. I, I think I would too, just because I think there are just more kills in yeah. Shogun Assassin, and this one is, is limited in that she's only really going after the, the three people. But this one has a lot more art to it and a lot more color and like vibrancy to yeah. it. Shogun Assassin is too long. Nah, so good. You should you should have to watch Lone Wolf Cub one and two because it's originally two full movies. Oh, I was making a reference to Kill Bill Volume Two. Oh, where BB wants to watch Shogun oh. Assassin, and he says, "No, Shogun Assassin is too long." No, <laughs> we'll watch Shogun Assassin. The other writer credit was for Norio Asada. He also adapted Snowblood Two and later anime feature Wicked City, which is a whole nother crazy yeah. thing uh, that you should check out. Though uh, the music here is from Masaki Hirao. He doesn't return for Snowblood 2, but he does have soundtrack credits for the songs reused in Kill Bill. The cinematographer here was Masaki Tamura. He was the DP on Tampopo. The editor was Asamu Inui. Uh, mostly pornographic work after this, or I guess they're called pink films in Japan. It was kind of like soft core pornography, but it became very mainstream for a while. Um, and a lot of actresses who were working in kind of low budget or B movies were getting roped into doing these pink movies because they were just very popular. And Miko Kaji really didn't want to be a part of that scene, which good for her. She's here playing Yuki Kashima. That's what she's credited as on uh, IMDb because I think the family name is Kajima when we see them being attacked by uh, by the bandits. Um, but the the canon character name is Shiryuki Hime. Uh, she reprised the role, as I said, in Lady Snowblood 2 around the same time she was playing Matsu the Scorpion in the Female Prisoner Scorpion series, which I think there were there were three before the first Snowblood, and then there was one between Snowblood and Snowblood 2, but it's a four-part series of films. Similar story, she's the main character seeking revenge, but she's in prison the whole time. So it's kind of like a Ricky O type thing, where a person is like getting vengeance on other prisoners and the uh, the staff of the prison and things like that. I've definitely seen trailers for it at the New Beverly, but I've never seen any of those movies. She still seems to work fairly regularly, including TV credits as recently as 2021. She also has, of course, a soundtrack credit on Kill Bill and other films which feature her vocals from this film's theme and other pop songs she's recorded. She's a very clear inspiration for Kill Bill's character Oren Ishii. And at least according to one source was offered the part of Oren Ishii, but I, I don't think that's true. I could only find that in one place that said that she was actually offered the part. Everywhere else I saw Tarantino say he had intended to hire a Japanese actress until he saw Lucy Liu in, I think, Shanghai Nights and was impressed with how she handled the action scenes in that movie. I guess he didn't see the Charlie's Angels movies because she does <laughs> yeah. lots of action in those. Yeah. But uh, that was where he was like, oh, maybe maybe she could do this job. And she's great in payback too. Yeah. Toshio Kurosawa played Ryu Ashio. He appeared in an episode of Shintaro Katsu's Zadoichi series just after this. Masaki Daimon played Go Kashima. I think that's the father who gets killed. Uh, after this, he appears in a couple Mecha Godzillas before playing Chief Junkichi Ito in 50 episodes of Ultraman 80. Miyoko Akaza played Sayo Kashima. That's the mother. She also showed up on that Zadoichi series. Takeo Chi played Takuichi Shoke. That's the guy who gets stabbed to death by the mother. He has lots of appearances as Onijima in Bebop High School, and he's Yoshida in 1968's Kill, which I think my brother and I caught Kill on IFC or something one time and like recorded it and just watched that movie over and over <laughs> again because it was so fun. And whenever my brother had to do school projects, he would constantly use music cues from the movie Kill and like recreate sequences from that movie of like people walking in those, you know, those big wooden sandals and 
and uh, stomping through the wilderness and slashing at each other. But it's a really fun movie. It's definitely worth checking out. Noboru Nakaya played Banzo Takemura. He was Juzo Mamiya on the Japanese Spider-Man series. He also appeared on a Lone Wolf and Cub series adapted from another manga from Kazuo Koiki. Yoshiko Nakata played Kabue Takemura. She was Yoko in 29 episodes of the early 70s Kamen Rider series, which I haven't seen it yet, but have you seen that trailer for Shin Kamen Rider? Oh, yeah, yeah, Looks yeah. It's so fucking cool. I'm very excited for that. I think well, it came I, out this year. Yeah. yeah, I just haven't had a chance to watch it. Akemi Nagishi played Tajira no Okiku. She's also in a few of the female Prisoner Scorpion films, and before that, she was Chikoro's mother in King Kong vs. Godzilla. Kaoro Kusuda played Otora Mikazuki. She also showed up on that Zaroichi show. That's the uh, sort of adoptive mother of the Yuki character in the film. Sane Nakahara played Kitahama Okono. We've seen her so far as young mother in Kinji Fukasaku's Virus the End, or Virus Day of Resurrection, for a Minnesota episode. Hosai Komatsu played Genzo Shibiyama. He voices Risley in the 1995 Lupin III Farewell to Nostradamus. Takahiku Ono plays an unspecified character, but also voices Aniaku in Spirited Away. That's the guy who's always like running down the halls and announcing mm. things. Hitoshi Takagi played Matsuman. His first credit was Suzuki Guard in Throne of Blood and a ramen shop owner in Tampopo, and he's the voice of Totoro. Yeah. Oh. The guy with all the shit on his face that's giving her leads on where to find the killers. I've been meaning to watch Tampopo. I have not seen it yet. Yeah, it's a good one. It's supposed to be good. Ichiro Kojima played Dr. Tadokoro in Fukasaku's Virus. Shoichi Hiroshi plays an unspecified character and also shows up in Yojimbo, Seven Samurai, The Hidden Fortress, and he actually plays King Kong in King Kong vs. Godzilla. He's also back in Snowblood 2 and later as a ramen trucker in the 1977 house, the Japanese house. I want to be a ramen trucker. Yeah. Kai Ato played a henchman. We saw him previously in Kagemusha. And Ko Nishimura played Priest Dokai, and he's also in Yojimbo and High and Low. Those are all the credits I have for this one. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow when we'll be discussing Serpico which IMDb describes like so. An honest New York cop named Frank Serpico blows the whistle on rampant corruption in the force only to have his comrades turn against him. We leave you now with the trailer for Serpico, a.k.a. Prince of the City Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Serpico. That thing on your lip, it goes. And get a haircut. This week you're eight to four, next week four to midnight. Make questions the older guys will fill you in. Okay, who are your playmates? Hey, Frank, you want a piece of this? How come you didn't stay for the fun? That's not my kind of fun. You talk to me. Save yourself. Hey, Frankie! How you doing? You keep asking me that. What's the matter with you? Well, I thought you were coming over to the house. Margaret invited Marianne over. Hey, Pasquale. I'm going to tell you something. See, all day long, I work with cops, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I go out, I see Marianne. Her father's a cop. Her brother's a cop. Her uncle's a cop. I got a feeling she's a cop, too. <laughs> I must have been nine, ten years old. I was this big. All my life, I wanted to be a cop. It's like I can remember nothing else. So what do you think, Frank, about the money? I don't know. But I'm not broke, and I don't have a family. I want to stick my neck out. It's already out, Frank. Not taking the money. Who the hell are you? Police, who the hell do you think we are? Where are you from? The borough, Manhattan 8. No, damn it. No, you're not from the borough. I just paid the borough this morning. We're not doing anything bad here. We're skimming a little gambling money. It's clean. 
If they would take all that energy, see, put it into straight police work, we'd have the city cleaned up in a week. If they clean up, there'd be no crime. Serpico, get in. OK, you might get by in the Bronx, but down here, 800 a month is chicken feed. Last week, one dope dealer, 120,000 split four ways. That's serious money. So as they ask you who's taking money? What I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, but you do know, Frank. Look, Frankie, I like you. I don't want to see anything happen to you. Serpico? You won't find anything on Serpico. He's clean. Serpico! See Inspector Palmer. Frank, it's very easy to um, get hurt. It takes a 14-shot clip. You expecting an army? No, just a division. We know how to handle guys like you. I had to cut your tongue out. There are many sides to Serpico. A hero who was hated, a loner who was loved, and to some people, the most dangerous man alive, an honest cop. Al Pacino is Serpico. The man, the book, the movie, the performance, the shattering impact of Cervical.